VCY America presents Crosstalk, a nationwide call-in program discussing issues that have an effect on our families, our communities, our churches, our nation, and our world. Crosstalk, an opportunity for you to voice your concerns for biblical principles. And now live by satellite and around the world on the Internet at vcyamerica.org. Here is today's Crosstalk. Well, thank you for joining us on Crosstalk here on the VCY America Network. We're going to get right into our topic today. It's an interesting one, and I trust that it will help to uh, better inform you on what's uh, inform you on what's going on in our nation. Our topic today is mobocracy, the cultural and political war to destroy our republic under God. With us is Dr. Jake Jacobs. He earned a Ph.D. in early American history from Northwest University with his dissertation titled The Influence of Biblical Ideas on Early American Republicanism and History. Yeah, public high school history teacher for some 25 years. He's known throughout the public education field as a politically incorrect instructor. He's a fighter of the NEA. President and founder of the Politically Incorrect Institute has degrees in American history and biblical and Judeo-Christian studies. Uh, He appeared on the Fox and Friends program to defend Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker. Uh, He's the author of the book, Mobocracy, the Cultural and Political War to Destroy Our Republic Under God. Dr. Jake Jacobs, welcome here to Crosstalk. Well, uh, hello. Glad to be with you. Uh, Time Magazine called its 2011 Person of the Year the protester, and you've titled your book Mobocracy, subtitled The Culture and Political War to Destroy Our Republic Under God. So let's talk about the title first, Mobocracy. Tell us what you mean by that title, because I didn't learn it in my civics class. <laughs> well, it, you, you, you're pronouncing it right. I think it's new to a lot of people, but it had it wasn't new to our founders. Uh, our founders um, used this term a couple hundred years back, and they made it a synonym or equal to the word democracy. Our founders did not trust democracy or the mob of individuals or the majority that could possibly turn against the minority or a violent minority that could turn against the majority. And so when I was down in Madison defending the governor and I went into the rotunda in the Capitol, I saw a mob had taken over the people's capital, and uh, I ended up titling the first chapter Winter Woodstock because inside they had taped all kinds of uh, socialistic fists, signs calling for the governor's head on a platter, signs to get rid of the recall of the governor, a union signs all over the place, the AFL jail, socialist fists. I saw them screaming over and over again, this is what democracy looks like. And I realized at that moment, this is what our founders warned us about, a disgruntled minority or a disgruntled majority that are going to demand, uh, they're going to ignore the election or are going to demand something from the government and the people. And so the word mob or mobocracy popped into my head, thus the title of the book. Now, for our listeners who are not aware of that scene in Madison, Wisconsin, because we have people across the nation, but it happened just a year ago, and, well, I guess we see occasional spots of it still happening today, but you used that term, Winter Woodstock. Uh, Can you just further describe that scene in Madison that would occur day after day after day, and and, uh, why you use that term, Winter Woodstock? Well, if if you, if you, in your mind, uh, if you could imagine literally hundreds and thousands of, uh, high school, college kids, um, 60 redux wannabes and sleeping bags, uh, all over the Capitol, um, there, it really, it stunk inside when I was in there from, from days of these people being there without showering. There was actually even some reports of marijuana being smoked. They were, um, having this incessant drumming, drum banging that was going on over and over again, which, by the way, is a tactic that's, uh, utilized by many socialists to agitate and to uh, uh, get the crowd going. There were these horns blowing. Um, they, like I had said earlier, there were signs everywhere taped all over the beautiful marble within the rotunda. And it, it had that feel of, uh, you know, pictures we've seen and movies we've seen when it comes to, uh, you know, concerts like Woodstock and things related. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting to note that one of the um, chants they kept on repeating was this is what democracy looks like. And I don't think they really realized, because of poor education in our schools, they actually were acting like the mobocrats, or what Democrats, small b, will do in a case where they're upset. Well, I I hear many people say, though, uh, 
Jake, that that the United States is a democracy. And I don't hear that just from ordinary citizens, but I, I've seen elected officials in state government and in national government often use this phraseology that the United States is a democracy. Uh, you're well versed in our Constitution. You're well versed in American history. Is, is that a true or a false statement? Well, I'll tell you, both Democrats and Republicans and many American citizens um, have made that mistake. They equate democracy as a synonym or equal to a republic. The fact of the matter is, in our rule book, the Constitution, the word democracy is not used once, not one time. And in Article 4, Section 4, if your listeners doubt me, they can always, you know, trust but verify, look up in the Constitution, Article 4, Section 4 says, and we shall have a Republican form of government. And it's not a coincidence that our pledge uh, to, uh, to allegiance, our pledge of allegiance, actually says, and to the republic for which it stands. It does not say, and to the democracy for which it stands. Now, it is true that 200 years ago, you would have seen a term like democratic republic. I don't have a problem with democratic republic as long as the democratic process is within a republican form of government. And the reason our founders did that was to make sure that there was a... uh, a division, a proper checks and balance, a representation within our government, that it wasn't pure, direct, democratic rule, because that's when you're dealing with the emotion of the, of, of the citizenry, which can cause problems, as you see throughout history. They wanted to have it where citizens, through the democratic process, i.e. election, would actually elect representatives with any Republican form of government. So... Uh, these terms, I've, I've seen, you know, even President Reagan, who I miss and I admire so much, he even used the term democracy. Um, it, part of the reason is we've had it, it hasn't been taught properly, especially since the 1960s in our country. And it started by, about 90 years ago, but really accelerated in the 60s. And by using Republican form of government, you're not meaning that in the partisan sense? No, 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 no. I'm talking in the political philosophy, and the political philosophy of the small R. Now, in your book, you often use the term republic under God. Uh, Further explain what you mean by that. Well, I'll tell you, I'm absolutely convinced that now more than ever, when I I see the secular, the explosion of secular progressivism, uh, secular atheism, uh, socialism, uh, uh, all these political big government uh, philosophies that are out there, our republic without God will die. It is dying, and one of the reasons it is is many of these uh, institutions and elements I just I just mentioned, they're very much against the belief uh, in the relationship between God and government. And our founders recognize that for a republic to be successful, whether it be John Adams, Patrick Henry, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, they talked about a republic that needed to be guided by God, that the, the Torah, the teachings of God, the instructions of God were implanted within the heart of the citizenry. So therefore, as good citizens, they would make for a good government. So they recognize a republic without God would be a republic that wouldn't last. Uh, John Adams, you mentioned his name. Uh, he's quoted in your book as saying, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Uh, did our founders know something that we just uh, don't know today here in, in this year? Well, I'll tell you, uh, you know, we live in a day and age of what, what many people will say, the postmodern America, postmodern world. And it's difficult for our young people and, and, and many individuals to understand the world of the founders of 1776 or 1787. Uh, the, that world was a pro Judeo Christian world, it was a pro biblical world. It was a world that believed in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And this, in this day and age of relativism, in this day and age of, of, of feel-goodism, in this day and age of, you know, whatever they, people want to do uh, since the 60s goes, they have a real hard time understanding that particular world. And that world, uh, you know, where our founders went to Harvard and Yale, which were Christian universities where they learned Latin and Hebrew and Greek, where they learned uh, the biblical text, uh, you know, John Adams could read it, the biblical text in Greek and in Hebrew. James Madison studied under John Witherspoon, the great Scottish theologian, the Hebrew language when he went to Princeton. John Witherspoon was the president of Princeton. He learned Hebrew so he could better ascertain and understand the the nuances and the meanings within the biblical text. Uh, It's not to say they were only trained in the Judeo-Christian worldview. They also understood uh, very profoundly the Greco-Roman world. That's why they knew Latin, and they could read Greek. 
So they pulled a lot of great things out of that world. Cicero, one of the great Roman uh, philosophers of, of that day, he believed uh, that a republic needed to have the law of God to guide individuals. They talked about the governor of the universe governing within the hearts and minds of the citizens. We're talking with Dr. Jake Jacobs, uh, author of Mobocracy. Uh, the subtitle of your book is also captivating, The Cultural and Political War to Destroy Our Republic Under God. Uh, did you use strong words for a sensational effect, or do you really believe that the words you use like war and destroy are apropos? Look, you know what I, I, I said, the cultural and political. This is a war of ideas. This is a war of philosophy. Uh, and, and, and this philosophy, this uh, what I call self-socialism or Fabian socialism or uh, cultural Marxism, these ideas are warring in our classrooms. There would have been a time in our history where most teachers, most administrators, most leaders would have rejected the cosmology or the worldview of communism or socialism, but we find it becoming more commonplace within our educational institutions. So I, I purposely used a, a title to catch the, you know, the viewer's eye because uh, we are in very precarious, dire situation in our history, and too much more of this in our republic under God will go under. We need to have citizens that are willing to speak out graciously but boldly lovingly uh, and patiently, but ultimately uh, from the rooftop. Uh, we, need to, we need to recapture this city upon a hill that Ronald Reagan and many of the great Puritan founders of this nation talked about uh, for, for many years. Now, you use the term Fabian Socialist. Uh, who are the Fabians, and how does that relate to this issue? Well, you know, uh, a little backdrop. Karl Marx, in his Communist Manifesto of 1848, called for a international, worldwide revolution, where the workers of the world, through militant means, would kill the rich, destroy the rich, destroy democracy, destroy capitalism, or destroy the democratic processes, and destroy the free enterprise system. Well, a lot of English intellectuals were steeped in the Judeo-Christian, Victorian Christian worldview, and they weren't going to be, they weren't going to grab a pitchfork or grab a gun and start killing uh, people in English society. So the Fabians were a bunch of intellectuals. They were professors. They were teachers. They were lawyers. They were doctors who adhered to Marx's atheistic worldview, but they said, we've got to be very clever. We have to do it uh, through politics. We have to change our language. We can't quote the Communist Manifesto. We have to use terms like social ju justice and redistribution of wealth, uh, economic justice, and we have to get it into the classrooms and get it into the music and get it into various cultural expressions, so eventually you'll have middle-class and upper-class intellectuals who will absorb it, and then it'll become commonplace in England. Well, that's why Maggie Thatcher was so hated. The conservative Christian prime minister in 1979 recognized England had been so steeped in big government socialism, the, the, the workers there, they freaked out because she was daring to challenge their particular worldview. So, and the Fabians, by the way, also infiltrated came over here about 100 years ago and infiltrated Harvard, New York University, uh, Brandeis, uh, University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, and they began to teach the college students of the 1930s and 40s and 50s. And they were able to permeate, culturally speaking and politically, the leaders that we have, uh, in many cases, running the nation today. Dr. Jake Jacobs with us here today on Crosstalk. We're going to take a quick 60-second break and come back to more of our discussion about his book, Mobocracy, the Cultural and Political War to Destroy Our Republic Under God. You're listening to Crosstalk on the VCY America Network. Back to Genesis with Dr. John Morris, creation researcher with ICR. Dr. Morris, do insects breathe like we do? No, Chris, they don't. Air enters through openings on the underside of the thorax and then leaves via the abdomen. There's a continual flow of air through the animal's body. But beetles, which live in the desert, have a problem. The hot, dry air passing through their bodies would quickly dry out the insect. But have no fear. God has a design mechanism to protect them. The beetle knows how to shut down 15 of the 16 openings during the day and uses only one to gather its air. By lying still in the meantime, it restricts its need until the evening when the weather is cooler. How does a beetle know how to do this, and how does it even know it has these air passages? God has designed even the lowly beetle with the ability to survive a variety of conditions, and he did all that back in Genesis. 
To discover more facts that support your faith, visit us on the web at www.icr.org. That's www.icr.org. Well, we've got a history teacher for some 25 years with us on Crosstalk today. He has his doctorate in early American history from Northwest University, Dr. Jake Jacobs. And we're talking about his book, Mobocracy, the Cultural and Political War to Destroy Our Republic Under God. Um, Dr. Jacobs, uh, as we are talking about uh, socialism and so on, your teaching uh, in the classroom did not follow the norms of the NEA agenda, but your teaching has been termed politically incorrect. Uh, uh, what did you do in the classroom that was so egregious? Well, um, the part of the problem is I, I, I always tell my students I put a big PC on the board and a big HC, and, I, and they, most of them know it means political correctness. And I say, you will not find me to be driven by the political powers that be that want me to teach a particular way a particular political way. It's not a coincidence that the Union was uh, profoundly Democratic, adhered to the Democratic Party, and therefore I had to teach in accordance to the Democratic Party worldview or cosmology, one of the being pro-choice, etc. I wouldn't do that. I would tell my students, we're going to teach H.C. or historical context or historical correctness. So I would take my students beyond the politically correct textbooks, the politically correct curriculum, and take them into the context of history. And a lot of times they would be blown away at things that were purposely ignored in the textbooks or ignored in the curriculum. Um, and I think that's an important uh, point to bring out. In many cases, I would bring up our Judeo-Christian heritage with our founders or the, the religiosity or the Christian background of Martin Luther King and, and quote the presidents, the, uh, their, their Judeo-Christian verbiage and rhetoric and their inaugural addresses. And this would upset the administration, because I was talking about God. And I simply was saying, no, I'm not. I'm teaching American history in its context. Hmm. Now, in, in your years of teaching, have, have the history textbooks always been this way? Or have you seen a systematic decline as far as their keeping to the uh, historicity of our nation? Now, that's an excellent question, Jim. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, when I teach, co- I teach uh, the history of the 60s at the college level at Lakeland College, and one of the textbooks I had to use was by a, uh, a member of, uh, well, he was president of the Students for a Democratic Society, which is socialistic origin, and he's now a college professor at Columbia, and he wrote a textbook called uh, Rage and Fury, uh, History of the Sixties, and, and he says, uh, he says, look, we, Reagan became governor of California, Nixon became president, we might have lost the politics of the sixties, but the one profound consolation prize was we won the textbook. And what he meant by that is the professors of uh, the, the students of the 60s and 70s are the professors of our classrooms today, and they, in essence, are controlling the textbooks. And so you find this sanitizing, this cutting and pasting of the Judeo-Christian worldview of, of the historicity of that taken out of the textbooks and a very secular, progressive, enlightened uh, uh, you know, ideas are put into the textbooks. One couple of classic examples is um, uh, the chapter in my world history textbook called The Enlightenment in the American Revolution. The word enlightenment is used, oh, enlightened, enlightenment, or enlightened, uh, yeah, enlightenment or lightened, or is used over 40 times, and the word Christ, Christianity, or Christian is used not one time in relationship to the American Revolution. And the fact is, Christianity, Christians, the Christian philosophy had a profound influence on the American Revolution. So that textbook is a classic example of what's happening across the country. Our young people are being robbed of this rich Judeo-Christian heritage that we have. That's one of another example is the scientific revolution. I take him into the textbook I was given. We talk about the scientific revolution. They were all enlightened, secular thinkers, according to the textbook. And we do research, and, and I show them that Sir Isaac Newton wrote more books on theology than he actually did on mathematics and physics. Hmm. Galileo, Copernicus, Kepler, they were all working from within a Judeo-Christian context and paradigm. Even the university is the study of the maker of the universe. People don't realize the origin of the word university, universe, single spoken sentence, actually comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, when, in, when God spoke in one single sentence, he creates the heavens and the earth. It's a fascinating concept that our university 
was were founded as Christian institutions. Well, what do you say to history teachers who are listening today about their responsibility in the classroom? Well, I'll tell you, there are uh, there are thousands of wonderful teachers in Wisconsin and across this country. Uh, some of them have been poorly trained. Some of them are scared to fight the powers that be. It could be the National Education Association, the WE Act, the Wisconsin Education Association, or it could be the ACLU or Freedom from Religion Foundation out of Madison. They're intimidated because they don't want to lose their jobs. So they might have an administrator who comes in and says, you can't be teaching these things in the classroom. Uh, what I can say is to try to find the courage and the wise wherewithal uh, you can find creative ways, as far as I'm concerned, of teaching these things with balance and a proper perspective. It doesn't have to be a one sided of thing. You can, you can teach evolution and creation and intelligent design in a very creative, intelligent way. I mean, Sir Isaac Newton quotes in, in many of his works his belief in an intelligent designer of the universe. So there's no reason why a teacher can't bring up the historical facts, the empirical evidence, to enlighten our students about uh, what we are as a republic under God. You actually believe that the NEA is a major contributor to the destruction of our republic. Isn't that being a little strong? Well, Jim, after 25 years of being in the classroom and seeing the dictates, the cosmology, the worldview, the values that have come out of the National Education Association, seeing them uh, with uh, writers as in, in conjunction with writers of the uh, Humanist Manifesto One, Humanist Manifesto Two seeing how they have this disdain for the Judeo-Christian worldview. They use this language of tolerance and, and pluralism, and yet when it comes to uh, Judeo-Christian or to the Christian faith, you find that they have a real hard time with that being expressed in the classroom. Uh, they're passionately, by the way, pro-death, pro-choice organization. And that's one of the reasons I did not want to belong to the Union, because I recognized they had values that clash with my values. And it's not a coincidence that the National Education Association has been in the pocket of the Democratic Party, or maybe I should say the Democratic Party has been in the pocket of the National Education Association. Mm. And, of course, they hate um, uh, competition, uh, uh, homeschooling and private schools, private Christian schools, because they recognize that competition will cause them some troubles because then people come to realize what actually has been, uh, what lack of education, proper education there's been in our public schools in this country. I, I would behoove any of your listeners to study the NEA and look at its origin and see their socialistic affiliations back in the day. You also call the ACLU, uh, quote, stealth socialism at its finest. Why did you say that? Well, to me, there's no doubt. In fact, that's a historical. That can be backed. It can be verified, confirmed through empirical historical research. Roger Baldwin and a number of the founders of the ACLU actually were believers in socialism and communism. Uh, and, and they, and it's not a coincidence that the ACLU are behind some of the big cases. The Scopes Monkey Trial of 1925 was that which was initiated by the ACLU. The ACLU did not want to have the Judeo Christian worldview taught in our classrooms. And that was a trial case for them. They may have lost the case in a small little decision down in the South, but they ultimately won the, you know, the, in, in the, uh, they, they won the fact that they could control the fact that now the Bible is not taught in, in any form or fashion in public schools in this country. Um, and so they, if you go back into the study of, like, Roger Baldwin, you find that he advocated communism, he went to the Soviet Union, wrote a book called Liberty uh, in the Soviet Union, and he actually talked about the dictatorship of the proletariat and the great job that Joseph Stalin was doing, and he came back to the state um, to advocate that talked about the evils of American democracy, and you can find these things, by the way, uh, online. They're, they're, they're easy to find as far as his background. And his very dear friends, one of them was Margaret Sanger. She was the, the founder of, of Planned Parenthood who called for the elimination, and I'm not making this up, the extermination of the African Americans through eugenics uh, that was really popular with the pseudoscience of that time period. He also was a dear friend of Helen Keller, who was a uh, believer in communism, and she was a co-founder of the ACLU. Also, Emma uh, Goldman, who was a radical anarchist and put in prison for calling for anarchy in the street, uh, were, were, were dear friends of his. You find that his roots and his colleagues and his associates were uh, were communists, and so they were, through litigious means, through a clever lawyering, uh, through intimidation um, in, in our institutions, the ACLU 
is finding ways to take God out of our country. As we kind of circle back now to, to Madison, Wisconsin, and how you described it and what you saw in Madison, how does this correlate then with the worldviews of communism and socialism? Well, look, once again, a number of teachers that I knew that were upset with the governor, uh, I don't, and I try to get this across to them, but when I, uh, how, what, how actually that the different groups, the various groups that were down in Madison joining in solidarity against the governor. Uh, when I, that's why I chose the red and black cover of my book, because that is, I saw a number of communists and anarchist flags down there, and that's why the, the colors represent communism and anarchy. And I saw the, the it, it, when the symbol of the movement to recall Governor Walker and to be and for the teachers to, to be behind this is the clinched socialist fist. It's a part of the Students for a Democratic Society, the socialist fist, the AFL-CIO. You saw that all down, down in Madison. So you saw locked arm in arm. You saw communists, anarchists, socialists, Students for a Democratic Society, the ACLU advocate, Freedom from Religion Foundation. You saw SEIU. You saw Hollywood movie stars with their fists up in the air. Trump, the head of the AFL-CIO, with a fist up in the air, demanding that the governor be recalled. It, it, to me, it's not a coincidence that these groups really have a serious problem with our Republican, small r, values that go back to the founding of the nation. And they turn to the government to, in essence, take the place of God. I don't think it, if you study their values, you see this, this correlation, this relationship. Why, why did you go on national TV, Dr. Jacobs, and defend Wisconsin's Governor Scott Walker? Uh, well, I have to admit, at first when Fox and Friends asked me, I was teaching that day at the college on a Saturday, and I, I, I told them that my wife told me uh, they, they had called. I said, just tell them I'm busy. I'm working all day. When I got back from work, they called again. Um, they said, would you be willing to do it? And I said, you don't realize what you're asking me. You need to go public on this. It's not that I'm, I, I was, I was going to say scared, because I, I will stand up for what I believe to be truth, but I recognize there were going to be relational ramifications, and there were going to be ramifications as far as, uh, you know, uh, the attacks that I would have to face. And it was ugly with colleagues. I had some pretty nasty emails, uh, individuals that wouldn't carpool with me anymore. Um, some, ugly, some pretty ugly things were said. Uh, I, I can live with that because what the governor and many of my Republican friends and the Republican representatives put up with Don and, and Madison in their lives since, uh, you know, it pales in comparison. I, I, did, I, I had nothing to put up with. But my point is, I feel that more citizens, through the various gifts that God has given them, need to be engaged and involved in our republic under God. We need to be involved in the process, whether it's writing letters to the editor, supporting a particular uh, organization like maybe Wisconsin Family Council or uh, supporting a good conservative Christian candidate. But our citizenry needs to speak up, needs to get involved, and not just to listen to a radio program, not picking on your program, but not just to listen, but to actually get up and do something to save our republic. I, 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 we don't have many more elections to, to be able to survive um, the onslaught of this big governmentism in our nation. Uh, Dr. Jacobs, do you see a correlation? I, I guess we're just seconds away from the break, so I'll have you be thinking about this, and we'll come back from the break and discuss it. But a correlation between uh, what we've talked about here, what you witnessed in Madison, Wisconsin, and the whole Occupy movement that has sprung up across the nation and actually around the world. We'll, we'll approach that here after the break. You're listening to Crosstalk on VCY America. I'll have a few more questions, and then we'll get to our phone lines here. We'll open those in a few moments. We'll be right back. Most people think of Freemasonry as a secretive but benevolent fraternity. But what exactly is it? Is it more than it seems on the surface? In the handy size booklet, authors John Ankerberg, John Weldon, and Dylan Burroughs present thought-provoking information, answering such questions as, What do the Masons teach about Jesus, salvation, and life after death? What do Masonic symbols represent? Is the God of the Bible also the God of the Lodge? Are Masonry and Christianity compatible? Can Christians join the Lodge in good conscience? The booklet provides a careful examination of Masonry compared to Biblical truth. 
To obtain your copy of The Facts on the Masonic Lodge, send a donation of $8 or more to VCY America, 3434 West Kilbourne Avenue, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53208. To make your donation by phone, call 1-800-729-9829. That's 1-800-729-9829. Mobocracy, the cultural and political war to destroy our republic under God. Its author is with us today in Crosstalk, Dr. Jake Jacobs. And uh, Dr. Jacobs, I had asked you just before the break to be thinking about this uh, matter of how you've described what's taken place in Madison, Wisconsin, this mob-like mentality. And and uh, do you see a correlation between what you've witnessed in Madison and the Occupy movement, uh, or is this two totally separate things? Well, uh, you know, I experienced the uh, the Governor Walker recall movement, what I call the the, the mob the mobocrats uh, down in Madison, and I went down to Madison to watch the Occupy Madison movement, and have studied the Occupy movement from Wall Street to San Francisco, and to me, they're the very same creature, the very same players on their Occupy stage. It's not a coincidence. Very same symbolism, terminology, organizations, actors that were in Madison for the recall walker are the very same individuals, symbols, actors that are on the stage for the Occupy. The clinch fist, power to the people, slogan, this is what democracy looks like, very common. Uh, Teamsters are down there. The SEIU, uh, the National Education Association is involved in it. Um, uh, Susan Sarandon, who went to Madison to scream and holler against the governor. Michael Millionaire Moore, the hypocrite who makes millions of dollars in a free enterprise system, and yet attacks the free enterprise system. He was not only in Madison, he's also in Wall Street. Uh, Jim Wallace, the Marxist, the so-called um, Christian Marxist, well, he is a Marxist in the philosophy. Uh, Jim Wallace, a red-letter Christian who was, uh, you know, believing in uh, the Occupy movement and involved in a lot of things related to the Madison uh, Recall Walker movement. It's the same players uh, advocating the same thing. If mobocracy prevails, what's in store for our country? I hate to think of that. I, I don't want to imagine that. I, I just, Jim, it just sends uh, chills down my back in a negative sense because what it means is the, it's, the, it's the end of America as we know it. It's the end of this wonderful republic, the greatest republic in the history of the world as we know it. Uh, we've seen all throughout history um, movements of the mob from the French Revolution all throughout the different banana republic revolutions down in Latin America to what's happening in Greece, uh, what's happening in Europe uh, as the government expands and spends money it doesn't have and the, and the citizenry are demanding uh, more money from the government even though it's broke or they're demanding they print more money. Uh, if, that, if, if it continues at that rate, then this nation will be dead within a generation. And for my children and my children's children's sake, I hope enough Americans are concerned to get involved and to turn this thing around. How is it our listeners can obtain your book, Mobocracy? It's real easy, jjusa.org, jjusa.org, or uh, amazon.com has it uh, in Kindle, Mobocracy, look up Jacobs, or uh, Barnes & Noble has it online. You would look up Mobocracy and my name, Jacob. Again, folks, that's jjusa.org. Dot O-R-G. Let's go to the phone lines. Our telephone number here to Crosstalk. If you have a question you'd like to ask, a comment you'd like to make, our number 1-800-733-9829. The Cultural and Political War to Destroy Our Republic Under God. Our call in number 1-800-733-9829. As we're waiting for these calls to come in, you have a chapter in your book on uh, Barack Obama, the intellectual from Marx to Alinsky. Why is this issue relevant to to our republic's survival and the issues we're talking about here? Well, I'll tell you what, it's very interesting. Uh, This last weekend down in Madison, the Wisconsin Education Association had a uh, seminar to teach teachers uh, on grassroots organization, and it was headed by the Industrial Areas Foundation, which was founded by Saul Olinsky, and Saul Olinsky was a self socialist who was a hero of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Anybody can look up Saul Alinsky. In fact, Barack Obama was involved in the love song of Saul Alinsky uh, film 
uh, play that came out back in the 90s. He even spoke at that. He's, he's one of his heroes. And Saul Alinsky was one of those kind of Fabian socialists who said, we need to find a clever way of overtaking communities and society uh, with socialism. And here it is, the teachers' union is actually associated with Saul Alinsky. It's actually the National Education Association recommends Saul Alinsky's book to be read by uh, Wisconsin public school teachers. Uh, they did that for a while, and then when enough people uh, complained, they took it off their website. Um, okay. Again, folks, the website, jjusa.org. Let's go to the phone lines. Line number one, we have Willie in Milwaukee. Go ahead, Willie. You're on the air. Yes. Uh, my question is, I was under the preponderance that uh, the Saudi government owns the largest uh, uh, book companies or book printing companies, the two largest book printing companies in America, and could that be a cause of why uh, the system is dumbing down the education system for children? Dr. Jacobs. Willie, that's uh, a great question. Let me tell you a story related to that. Uh, back in the early 90s, I went to a conference down in Madison. It might have been late 80s, as you get older, you forget years. I went down to a social studies conference down in Madison for a weekend, and it was sponsored uh, through um, the Wisconsin Education Association, but it was co-sponsored by the Saudi government. And the Saudi government gave me uh, a free Quran and a bunch of literature talking about the beauty of uh, Islam. Hmm. Uh, When I made the politically incorrect mistake of bringing up the concept of jihad and that Muhammad was involved in 70 offensive wars, and, and hated Jews and killed many Jews and Christians, I was, I was shunned, I was ostracized, I was told to shut up, and I wasn't welcome at the conference. Um, and so the, the point is, there is a strong influence uh, that people don't realize through the Saudi government. Dr. Jake Jacobs with us. Again, the book is Mobocracy. His website, jjusa.org. Ready for our next caller here today on Crosstalk. And uh, lines are packed here, so we'll get your calls in here at 800-733-9829. And let's go to uh, Jim, our next caller. Go ahead, Jim. You're on the air. Uh, I completely uh, agree with this. Uh, I work for uh, the state of Wisconsin. I work in a small town, and I'm a pro walker. And these people that I've worked with for 10 years have come at me with a vengeance, uh, foul language, her, uh, just call me at home, hang up, call me at my work number. It, it's really dangerous for people that work for the state of Wisconsin to say they uh, support Walker, and uh, it, I, I just wanted to concur with him. So. Oh. Thank you for the call here. Uh, Dr. Jacobs, are, are you finding that to be pretty universal, that that these kind of tactics? I mean, we've seen some horrendous uh, threats come against uh, the governor himself uh, and and uh, those within his party over matters just like this. Well, you know, uh, I have two thoughts on it. One, I do know a number of teachers. In fact, one that was in my house yesterday, uh, a sister of a dear friend of mine, uh, she saw my I Support Walker sign in the yard, and I know her. She's a wonderful person, a kind person. She would never be involved in that. And there are a number of teachers I know that would not be involved in the hate talk and the ugly things that I saw. But with that being said, there's a profoundly significant number, an inordinate amount of teachers that that are calling Hitler Stalin and, and, and uh, uh, Hitler uh, Mubarak, uh, teachers that are saying Republicans are haters and they're Nazis, and teachers that are, uh, are saying some pretty vile and ugly things. And, it, they, you know, when you equate a governor who is attempting to balance the budget and live within our means to Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, it's not only a very naive and stupid thing to say, it really reflects what's happening within our educational system for people to have a moral equivalency of a governor trying to balance the budget to mass murderers like Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler. Hmm. Let's go next to Danny from the state of New York. Danny, you're on the air. Hi, I was, uh, I've been listening to the program, and I was interested, when you're talking about the Occupy movement and um, the protesters in Wisconsin, and particularly right now talking about calling our leaders Hitler and Stalin, whether or not you would apply the same standard or whether or not you would consider the more abrasive elements of the Tea Party to be engaging in sort of the same uh, destructive discourse. Dr. Jacobs. 
Yeah, good. Danny from New York, uh, a great question. Um, I actually have a chapter in my book where I compare the Tea Party to the Occupy mobocracy. And the fact is, uh, I speak in the Tea Party circuit. I, I didn't do it because I wanted to. I happened to observe it because I had heard that the Tea Partiers were called a bunch of Nazis by uh, Nancy Pelosi and other, and other Democrats. So I went to observe an early Tea Party in my area, which is Appleton, Wisconsin. And out of the thousand people that were, I saw a couple of signs that were highly inappropriate. And I, I told them so. And I said, this is to represent ultimately the cause for limited government in a republic under God. Uh, there's a small, small uh, uh, fringe within the Tea Party, but every Tea Party I've been in, I've been at dozens, will be at dozens more, I have seen a group of people who are, they clean the place up, they're not taking things over, they're not uh, desecrating the American flag, they're uplifting uh, Christianity and doing many affirming positive things. Um, and they're self-police, so to speak. Uh, so to me, the comparison between the Occupy movement and the, and the Tea Party movement is a very weak comparison. Um, hello? Yes, go ahead, Danny. But what about, say, you know, the town hall meetings, which were sort of all over the news, where people were trying to make statements, people being uh, legislators, and you saw people screaming and you saw people shouting, and it sort of cut off any rational discourse about what was going on. Okay, Thank you. Well, I, Okay, that, once again, very good. I've been to a number of those meetings, uh, especially in this area, dealing with Obama's uh, health care, a uh, big government health care situation. And the meetings there, there were, there were citizens that were upset. And you're always going to be dealing with that element of the emotion. Our founders warned us about that. But you didn't see this decrying of eating the rich and killing the rich and and destroying capitalism like you see in the Occupy movement. You didn't see people flying anarchists and communist flags. Yes, you're going to find some individuals that are going to be disrespectful and rude, which is something that shouldn't be. Now, I also saw a number of impassioned individuals, in the spirit of a Patrick Henry, were saying, enough of this big governmentism. We are going to defend ourselves from the government taking over our lives. I don't have a problem with that myself. But, Danny, you do bring up the point that, Sometimes the discourse is not as civil as it should be, and I concur with that. Thank you, Danny, for your call here today, 800-733-9829, uh, to Fond du Lac. And uh, Louise, you're on the air. Hello, Louise. Oh, yeah, I wanted to ask if the, the guest is familiar with Dr. Blumenfeld's NEA Trojan Horse in Modern Education. Yes, I am. It's a brilliant work. It came out early, early, many years ago, and I, when I would have it on my desk at work, uh, it, it didn't uh, go over very well. Let's put it that way. Mm. Oh, I, I yes. know. I, I'm 85, and I'm blind for four years, but I'm lucky I can hear your, listen to your program I found four years ago. And, and when I taught for 24 years, they took away, they took away the spelling books, and the next year the phonics, and the next year the reading books. It was frightening to older teachers. We tried to cover them with paper and still use them, but we were called upon. We were warned not to use the old books, and the new ones had weird stuff in them that, I don't know, the young teacher just went along with it. Mm. You know, they didn't know what was going on. It's certainly frightening. I'm, I'm thankful for your show. Thank you, Louise. We appreciate your call here today to Crosstalk. We're just seconds away from a break, and uh, so not time to for another call until after the break. And uh, so stay with us, folks. We'll take more of your calls here in just a moment with Dr. Jake Jacobs, author of the book Mobocracy, The Cultural and Political War to Destroy Our Republic Under God. The website, jjusa.org. We'll be back in just one minute. For the Worldview Weekend Minute, I'm Brandon House. Our website is worldviewweekend.com. As I study Romans chapter 1 and I look at the five signs or five consequences that God is removing his hand of protection from a nation, I think I see what's happening to America more clearly. One of the things I must be careful of is the sin or desire to place my family above what God desires for my family. God may very well want my children to live in a nation that is hostile to them so that they might seek him. I have to ask myself as a father, 
Has the materialism of our nation made our children and grandchildren more likely to seek after God? Or are they materially satisfied and have need of nothing? If God desires persecution to come to our nation, to get the attention of our children and grandchildren, and to drive them to the cross, I pray for persecution. It's better to be persecuted in this life and come to salvation through Christ than to be comfortable in this life and to be tormented in hell for eternity. For the Worldview Week in Minute, I'm Brandon House. You're listening to Crosstalk on VCY America. Dr. Jake Jacobs with us today, and uh, time is going fast. We're going right back to the phone lines here to Port Huron, Michigan. And uh, Harry, you're on the air. Hey, guys. Um, a question, and then a quick follow-up. Um, difference between, because I hear this thrown around all the time, republic and democracy. Is it just majority rules with republic uh, compared to, like, democracy, 51%? Is that what we're talking uh, no, not necessarily. Um, well, I mean, the democracy is the idea of a majority, a majority controlling, but the republic, the key thing, the republic is actually choosing representatives, mm-hmm. not a pure direct where the citizenry rules. Really, the citizenry, while it's we the people, there are limitations for them. They don't directly rule. They, they choose people that rule for them. That's a republic. Here's my problem with that, yep. uh, Professor, and that is, as you know, it seems like more and more and more in politics these days, we send people to Washington or Madison or Lansing here in Michigan. or whatever. We send people to uh, do things for us up there, and they don't listen anyway. Mm. Um, it's very, very – I can understand the pessimism that people feel. And I've been politically involved for 25 years. But I understand the, the desire for – power to the people and people ruling. I, I understand it because the people that are in politics have no interest in serving us. Good point. Uh, your response, Dr. Jacobs. Wow, I, I tell you, I think it's interesting. You're from Port Huron. That's the origin of uh, Students for Democratic Society back in the six, early 60s. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's a very valid point, the frustration with our representatives within a Republican form of government. And that's, that's that fine line. I mean, it's we the people. We do want power to the people, but our founders, when they studied human nature, recognized the tendency for people to get emotional to the point where they violate the rule of law. And as a number of individuals that I saw down in Madison and what they were calling for, they were angry. Uh, the unions were, were, were getting militant in their, their rhetoric and, and the idea of, you know, uh, uh, that Walker was a tyrant when actually he was elected into office legitimately. Those are some of my concerns. So, uh, bottom line is, I, I understand what the gentleman is saying that we that many American citizens, many of the people, are frustrated with representatives that give us the rhetoric of the republic or republicanism in its proper sense, but they don't live up to it. And they also have the, the and they have the chance to change that at the next election as well. At, at the next election, yeah. at, and at, yes, that's. Well, I'm not a big advocate of the recall because the recall really is, is, is uh, something to me that goes against the face of what happened in November of, of 2010. The people spoke, a vast majority won, the Republicans were in control, and through the proper processes, they changed the law. Let's go to West Dallas, Wisconsin. Brad, you're on the air. Hi. Uh, part, of the, uh, part of the definition of uh, republic that I didn't know if you covered was it was under law. We, mm, we yeah. have people that represent us. We vote for them in a democratic fashion, but they represent us under law. For example, it has to be according to law. If everybody in the nation can be in favor of rape, but that's against the law, so the law wins. But anyway, I want to get to to that caller that said uh, that cast dispersions on the Tea Parties and the the people that uh, go to town hall meetings. Uh, The Tea Partiers were described by you very well. I was at a few of them, and everybody picked up everything. And it was cleaner when we left than when we got there. And uh, as for the uh, town hall meetings, any negativity there is brought on by the agitators from the left, like the union cowards, the so-called students, you name it, any, any nutbag they can get. I saw it even on, on television where the lefty media even showed local political figures that had to be escorted from there for their own safety because of these left-wingers. Thank you, Brad. So I, I don't want these, these people coming on putting uh, false dispersions on the Tea Partiers or the people that go to these town hall meetings to talk to their representatives. 
Thank you, Brad. Uh, Shelly in Madison, you're on the air. Hi. Um, I just want to make a comment. I work in Madison. I work um, actually for the state. Um, and uh, I um, saw a lot of oppressiveness last year um, with all of this, what he was talking about in the Capitol going on. And um, I, I believe we should do something, too. One of the things I do is I, I go to the Capitol every day. I've done it for like a year and a half now to pray at 10 o'clock mm. at the, on the steps. And um, I haven't had any Christi- other Christians join me. I did have someone up in the window wave at me the other day, um, I think, saying, you know, thank you. But um, if other Christians would like to join me, that would be great. The other comment I have is I think the book's great. And, I, I mean, I, I you know, obviously I would... Um, I'd like I'd like to read it. I want to read it, but I'm I'm thinking a lot of the people who re- will read it are the people who don't necessarily need to read it. If you get my gist, and the people who really need to read it, um, like you said, they're caught up in emotion and uh, not real reasoning. I'm I'm just wondering if there's any way to like YouTube is is just such a great medium today, but I don't know. You know, it's just I'm something I'm throwing out there. It, okay. it really can can. Uh, affect a lot of people. Um, but anyhow, I just think this program is great today. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Dr. Jacobson, a response? Yeah, a couple things. The book deals with, uh, there's 16 chapters. The first chapter is on Madison. The last chapter is on Madison. The rest of it deals with this explosion of stealth socialism and communism and big governance. It's kind of a history of it. Uh, you can find it on YouTube under uh, Dr. Jake Jacobs, Mobocracy. I have a one-hour teaching on the book that you could watch. To get a sense of what I teach on there. And by the way, Shelley, I think that was her name. I absolutely love the fact that you are praying at 10 o'clock at the Capitol. You know, my subtitle says the cultural and political war. It actually could have the word spiritual war. And to, to see that you're doing that, I think, is absolutely wonderful, and I commend you for that. We have time for a quick comment or a question here from Barry in Ohio. You're on the air, Barry. Yeah, I turned in uh, and tuned in kind of late, and I heard him talking about uh, Saul Lewinsky. And, um, you know, I don't know if people are familiar with, I don't know if you mentioned the book Rules for Radicals. And uh, in this book, Lewinsky has that uh, this book was dedicated to uh, Lucifer, mm-hmm. the, ori- the original radical. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is just uh, for your information, this is the kind of mindset that we're dealing with. And the only thing that's going to really help our country is if um, we have Second Chronicles 714, if, if we, the church, the church... I mean, it's not a political answer, it's a spiritual answer. Barry, thank you so much. A quick comment, Dr. Jacobs. Well, he's absolutely right. Uh, in the book, I do bring up the fact that it was dedicated to Lucifer, who he calls the very first radical. And it's not a coincidence that uh, Barack Obama, President Obama's radical agenda, relates to the radical intellectuals around him. The Derek Bell, uh, the professor of critical theory, which is really a form of Marxism, is a part and parcel of Barack Obama's worldview and his mindset. And that's why I think people need to read a book like mine to understand that. We're out of time here. Dr. Jake Jacobs, thank you for being with us here today on the broadcast. Well, thank you very much. I always enjoy being with you, Jim. And folks, the website is jjusa.org. The book, Mobocracy, The Cultural and Political War to Destroy a Republic Under God. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Crosstalk via satellite and the Internet from BCY America. Views expressed may or may not be those of this station. For a CD of today's program, send a donation of $6 or more to VCY Tape Ministry, 3434 West Kilbourne Avenue, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53208. Or download by RSS or podcast from CrosstalkAmerica.com. And join us again for Crosstalk. Crosstalk.